The author meets the critics. It's The Author Meets the Critics, the original program where the author of a new book meets and exchanges his opinions with his severest critics, the nation's top book reviewers. And now here's the man who keeps the peace on these programs, your regular chairman, John K.M. McCaffrey. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Ken Banghart. Today's headlines are filled with news of trouble in Asia, fighting in Indonesia, civil war in China, bickering in India. Whatever our attitude may have been prior to World War II, we now know that in one world, rumblings in countries thousands of miles away inevitably have strong reverberations here in these United States. Many of you may remember that in 1940, a book was published by Edmund Taylor entitled The Strategy of Terror. Mr. Taylor's book had an important part in, awake in the awakening of the American people to the repercussions of the fall of France, the meaning of that event to those of us across the Atlantic. Mr. Taylor has written a new book, which some critics believe may well be the most important book published this year, for it teaches a lesson that can help us to avoid World War III, those ominous words. The book is Richer by Asia, and with us this afternoon, along with the author, Mr. Edmund Taylor, are two well-known foreign correspondents to tell Mr. Taylor, to his face, what they think of his new book. First, a former INS correspondent in the Far East, the well-known lecturer and author, Mr. John Getty. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Taylor took two years in Asia and 423 pages to convey what most of us already concede, that the only thing we fear is fear itself, or in his technical robosity, delusion. Mr. Taylor repetitiously raises us to high crests of religious psychiatric reasoning, only to drop us again with a cruel thud to middle-of-the-path semantics. An avowed atheist, Mr. Taylor doles out religious beliefs, some Hinduism there, some Buddhism there, plenty of pantheism, and little but very little Christianity, but never any Islamic tenets. When he goes deeply into India's other faiths, he scores Islam by the device of omission. He cites India's virtue as being able to oppose without hating, yet daily reports from India tell of Hindus and Muslims butchering each other by the scores. He impliedly seems to be against war, yet adds that his own wartime service was an enriching experience. He puts into Indian mouth a harsh arrangement of America for dropping the atomic bombs, but he does not himself go on record as to what can we can definitely do about the A-bomb, unclouded by any ifs and buts. Richard by Asia is terribly wordy and packed with unconvincing sophistry. We can but echo Mr. Taylor's wife who wrote him in India thus, and I quote, I admit your letters make India sound like an interesting place, but what is it all about? That is obviously the statement of the opposition. Let us hear now from the other side. The former head of the China News Service, radio commentator and foreign correspondent, Mr. Bruno Shaw. This book, Richer by Asia, by Edmund Taylor, proves to me how important it is for people like Mr. Getty to read it. But I hope most of those who do read it are impressed by the clarity and the vision in the book rather than permitting their own confusion to be more compounded. This is one of the best books that I have ever read, and I agree with Owen Lattimore's criticism of it in the Herald Tribune that it should not be overlooked by the Pulitzer Prize Committee. And with regard to charges that it is confused or repetitive, let me quote briefly from two critics who have just reviewed the book for the same paper, the New York Times. One of them, Orville Prescott, says this has been written in an involved, generalized, graceless prose of singular opaqueness, and the author has lost his way and retraces his own tracks. But going over the same ground a little bit doesn't necessarily mean that the author has lost his way any more than going out onto a precipice and looking over the Grand Canyon once or twice means that one has lost his way. One wants to see the beauty and to give it to other people more than once, and that's what Mr. Taylor has done. And here's what Margaret Mead in the Times has said about that losing his way and retracing. Each of these themes is treated intric int intricately. The author returns to each again and again as he shows how systems of institutionalized delusions build up. In Richer by Asia, Edmund Taylor takes his readers on a unique adventure into the mind and spirit of the Far East. It's a fascinating story and a well-told one, and best of all, it is guaranteed to stimulate the reader into doing a little mental exercise of his own, and that's good for all of us. Well, there you have the two critics' points of view. In a little while, you'll hear from the author. But first, here's a word from your announcer. 
This series of broadcasts, sponsored by the Book of the Month Club, is directed to everyone interested in books and particularly to the thousands of members of the Book of the Month Club in this area. The book to be discussed today, Richer by Asia by Edmund Taylor, was recently published by Houghton Mifflin and was submitted some time ago to the Book of the Month Club as a possible selection. It was enthusiastically received, and while it was not selected, it was reported upon in a recent edition of the Book of the Month Club News. As all members of the club know, the Book of the Month Club News each month reports on the best of the new books. Reading the news regularly is the way club members keep abreast of important reading and make certain that they don't miss any of the vital new books. The news also reviews fully the current selection of the judges, which this month is a dual selection. The Last Days of Hitler, written by H.R. Trevor Roper and published by the Macmillan Company, and Vespers in Vienna, written by Bruce Marshall and published by Houghton Mifflin. You can get a copy of the Book of the Month Club news by writing to the Book of the Month Club in care of station WNBC, New York 20, New York. And now back to Mr. McCaffrey. Well, gentlemen, uh, you have stated very well for our audience your feelings about this book and to a certain extent why you feel that way. Well, now, certainly one of the things that strikes us as we read Richard by Asia, and particularly as Mr. Shaw quotes a review by Margaret Mead, is that Mr. Uh, Taylor has claimed considerable indebtedness to Margaret Mead for attitudes uh, in this book. I think that also he would go back to Ruth Benedict and to patterns of culture, because he has essentially, in Richard by Asia, tried to give us an almost psych psychiatric interpretation of a country, areas, and peoples. Uh, whether that is a sound technique or not, I don't know. I don't know anything either about the areas or about psychiatric techniques. Mr. Shaw, do you feel that uh, it is possible to do this? I think not only it's possible, but that Mr. Taylor has done it excellently. Mr. Taylor has had necessarily to go abroad to get out of this country to see what's wrong with this country. And many of us often uh, can uh, find out what's wrong with ourselves and what's wrong with things in our immediate neighborhood only by going outside of it and looking at it from an objective viewpoint and uh, looking upon other people's and other people's delusions. And then finding that we can not only uh, uh, understand why they are deluded, but apply that understanding to some of the delusions that exist around us, which up to that time we may not have been aware of. Now, Mr. Getty, you were particularly concerned with the word delusion. Do you want to come well, in here? I am there. Mr. Shaw is under one of the delusions because I grant you that Mr. Taylor did say that, he, that that's what he achieved by going to India. But then he adds, after you've read the 423 pages, that he could have achieved the same thing by staying in the United States. Mr. Shaw? Well, it seems to prove to me that uh, we had better leave our minds open about those things which we believe we are able to do. Mr. Taylor has taken about 400 pages to try to tell us that one must not jump at conclusions, that one must try to have an open mind, a liberal mind, and while he may very well believe that he would have come to the same conclusions had he not gone abroad, while he may think so, I don't. Because all of us uh, at this table have been abroad and have spent many years, some 15, 20 years in the Far East, and we know that the experiences that we have had there have had very important reactions and very important control over our own thinking back here. Well, now, just a minute, Mr. Shaw. Most of my experience has been in Peking, <coughs> Illinois. That applies to you and Mr. Taylor and Mr. Getty. But uh, let's, let's get back to the book, to a very serious charge, which Mr. Getty has leveled at it, and that is that in his discussion of India, that he has scorned uh, the whole Islam and Islamic no. context in India by ignoring it. I that, don't think so. Oh, well, he has, Mr. Mr. Shaw, because he, he mentions Jinnah and, and the Pakistan government and doesn't concede that it's going to go into effect, which it is next, next Friday. Well, Mr. We're Kenny. going to have two Indias, and he said the Pakistan is an evil weed, and it should, should not go into effect, and he doesn't think it will succeed. And let me quote you there when you're talking about reality and the lessons of this book. He says, Indian politics are largely a shadow play of delusions. Now, certainly the two Indias that come into the world on Friday are not, dis not delusions. And then he goes on to say, most important to Indian social relations is not truth but harmony. And there you've got the biggest split of any nation in the world. Now, Mr. Taylor had his right to be convinced of the things that he got from India. That was his own personal right. But I don't think he is, he is fair to readers in saying, now, this is the way things are. 
because they aren't the way he says, as shows by this division in India. But sure. Mr. Uh, Getty, let's get back a minute. You're accusing Mr. Taylor of a lot of things he didn't say and of a lot of things I'm sure he'll tell you he didn't think. Because you say first that he didn't spend any time on Hinduism, and at the same time you complain that he's written 423 pages. <laughs> now, had he, uh, or rather on uh, Muslimism, had he spent much more time on Muslimism, he would have had another 50 pages, but he does spend a great deal of time on it. No, he and doesn't mention the Muslim opinion, faith at all, he, Mr. He is so convinced, as you must be, and as I certainly am, that Pakistan is the most fantastic thing on earth. I don't know whether uh, our audience here or our radio audience understand Pakistan thoroughly. I might take a brief moment Please to tell what Joe. it is and why Mr. Taylor has been so appalled at it and didn't believe that it could come about until it did. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean he was wrong. It's just one of those fantastic things. Well, that what means is it? It's not a delusion. The cause of their delusions. Well, what is pa it? Pakistan in India. <clears throat> Uh, let me translate it into, a, into <coughs> its American application so that you can understand it. It would be as though the city of Chicago, let us say, in Illinois, and the city of New York in the state of New York were each to be separate, independent governments from their own state. That Chicago and New York City were to be one state, combined with the state of Maine and the state of California and, the, and Mexico City. That all these widely separated areas within other areas which are Hindu belong to one independent unified state. Now, if you can consider a state as anything so fantastically conceived, operating both from an economic or political standpoint, you have Pakistan. Many of us didn't believe it could happen. Well, Mr. Getty, you say that it does. It does happen, and there, therefore it can't be a delusion. And when, when you say that you have division in the country, you can't say there's harmony there. Mr. Getty, you don't and understand. fairly portray that to delusion. other people. It is the delusion in, in, in the mind of the Muslims that impelled them to create this illusory state of Pakistan. Oh, which now you're getting act. worse than Mr. Taylor, and that's saying a lot when you get in illusion and delusion. Because, to my way of thinking, a lot of well, this book I is like the Indian both. rope trick. You know it doesn't happen, but it fascinates you. You try to find about it, and any moment you think this book's going to fly up into the, but, to the air. But, the, the two words, illusion and delusion, are not uh, incomprehensible. The, illu the delusion is on the part of the Muslims, and in their minds it creates an illusion of a separate state. I don't think that's too difficult to No, comprehend. I don't think that it is an illusion of a separate state. There's 60 million Muslims there in a state that's going to get into the United Nations, so it's not a delusion. And anywhere in that whole question, Mr. Uh, Taylor talks about the Indian nightmare, and he said by learning about the Indian nightmare, he dissipated his own. But I doubt if many readers will find their own nightmare dissipated because it builds up the neurosis in you. Everything is fear. You, you, there's no way to get around it. You gr grant that these things he say is so, that a Muslim hates a Hindu because he thinks the Hindu hates him, and the Hindu hates the Muslim because he hates him. Well, where'd he go? It's what the what Mr. Taylor quotes the G.I. in India saying. It's a rat race. And that's more or less where you get... Have you got any particular rat you're betting on, Mr. Shaw? Yes, uh, I'm betting on the fact that this book will be better understood by a great many people who read it than apparently it is by Mr. Getty. Well, I didn't uh, at least have to quote other reviewers. I have at least made at least 70 notes on my own, and I don't think Mr. Shaw will stand I up on that. I didn't quote them for the sake of uh, having them set up my argument for me. I quoted well, them merely to show that on the same book, two critics in the same newspaper can have such widely opposed views. Well, let's get back to facts. Now, Mr. Taylor talks about Hinduism as being healthy-minded, and about the Indian people as being happy. Now, I refute those, and I think anyone else who knows India will say the same. That the Indians are not a happy people. They're sour and dour. They've got reasons for it, but that's what they are, especially compared to the other Asiatics. And Hinduism, I think, has been felt by most people to be just the opposite of a, of a healthy religion. It's unhealthy in every way in its practices and what it does to the Indians. Well, there, there I think that we've, we've got to bring our author on because he has a lot of things to say about that kind of attitude that you've just expressed about accusing them of being unhealthy and, and morbid. He brings into the question of whose neurosis, uh, whose bed of neurosis are we standing in is, is a very important point in Mr. Uh, Taylor's book. So I think now that we ought to hear from the author of Richer by Asia, Mr. Edmund Taylor. Before I take up in detail some of the charges uh, Mr. Getty makes against my book, I'd like to say a more general thing about what I had in mind in writing the book and why I gave it the title I did, Richer by Asia. To me, that title meant really 
just what it says. I felt that my whole stay in Asia, my exposure to the Asiatic cultures and the Asiatic life, had enriched me, made me in every way a richer person than I was before I had gone there, for I'd gone to the East, and extending that, that view, I believe that more knowledge of the Eastern cultures and what is going on in the Eastern countries would enrich all of us in much the same way that my stay in Asia enriched me personally. Well, did you, were you enriched? Uh, did you find out more in this book actually and concretely, Mr. Getty, about Asian civilization? Oh, I did very much. Of course, I belong to the school of thought that there's no bad book about Asia, that there are only good and better books. We know so little about Asia that any book is, is, is better than no book. And I find, oddly enough, after some 26 years in Asia, that my own experiences parallel Mr. Taylor's very much. Only I don't think that the, his, the delusions that he created were, were based on, on facts as I found them. But otherwise, I, I think that anyone is going to be richer by Asia from having read this book. I don't like the shift in your attitude well, at I'm all, Mr. Well, I'm not shifting at all. I'm just as firmly fixed as I was before because I think that this... I think that... I know that Mr. Taylor could have written one of the best books ever to come out of Asia. The straight writing parts in this book are very good. There's no question about it. But when he gets off into the psychiatry and psychoanalysts and, and different religions... Well, uh, he's just richer by Asia, and that's only his, his own advantage, and not for the general reader. I think if he This could... is the first person who has dealt with a psychoanalyst who could be said to be richer, but Mr. Shaw. Uh, let us get away for one second, Mr. Getty, from the psychoanalytical aspects of the book, and take something with which you are perhaps more familiar. Let's take the statement that was made to Mr. Taylor by the Indian doctor who said that it seems to be a crime to train a doctor, uh, have him spend four years in a medical college, who is able to treat so few of the vast number of people in India who need treatment and who need understanding of what hygiene and sanitation means. In other words, a wide preventative program rather than a curative program for the very few. Well, yeah, no, right. uh, I think that, Mr. Shaw. You don't no. mean to say that just because you need midwives and nurses, you're going to stop having doctors. And that's what Mr. No, Taylor and no. Sense said, oh, adopting no. an Indian, do nothing point of view. You know, you better read that book again. I'm I will read it again. I intend to. And... Because Mr. Taylor doesn't simply say any such thing. Well, now, let, if you let me get back on that track. Well, just a minute. Let, let me ask Mr. Taylor. Did you say that, Mr. Taylor? I said that, but not exactly in the way that Mr. Getty quotes it, and while, like a good Buddhist, I would not like to rub the, the uh, salt of reproof into the wound of Mr. <laughs> Getty's error, <laughs> I think he was quoting me badly out of context there. Uh, and may I get back to that, uh, Mr. McCaffrey? What I wanted to show was this. We are so dedicated to the principle of training doctors for these backward areas. We must have doctors, graduates of medical schools, that we overlook the important thing that Mr. Taylor has told us, that doctors are important, of course, but nurses who are more quickly trained and in greater numbers, uh, and uh, sanitary uh, workers, are of much more importance in preventing people from getting into the state where they'll need the doctor. Now, you know yourself, Mr. Getty, uh, how things are in the Far East, in China, as well as India. I was in a little village in the interior of China one time, and I was very much astonished in a village square to see a mendicant a little peddler with a basin of water and a toothbrush. He had been to a medical missionary, and the missionary had explained to him the use of a toothbrush and had given one. And there, in the middle of the square, he was allowing all comers to use this toothbrush in that same basin of water <laughs> at a copper a, a chance, one penny apiece, without ever washing it. That man did more to spread more disease all over that village and countryside than any number of doctors could possibly have cured. That's what I think Mr. Taylor is getting at, that we should get down to the fundamentals and try and tell this Chinese what a germ is and not leave it in his mind that a germ is one of these foreigners' fantastic notions like some of the other fantastic well, things. Well, you're not going to say that, that that enriches you by getting down to the Indian level. What I said, let's bring Indy up to our level, have doctors and mid-nurses. And it, and... it enriches me because from that moment, my approach to the problem of widespread illness and decay, physical decay in China, alters. I see what's necessary to attack that. I didn't see it before. I thought it was really a good thing to train doctors only. Doctors are needed. But in my mind, why, sanitary workers were far more important than any doctors could be. More people were being killed by that toothbrush, as I say, than any 500 doctors could cure. 
Mr. Taylor, do you feel that Mr. Shaw has properly represented you here? Yes, I think he's doing, doing an excellent job there, but there's one, one little point I, I would like to bring up here. I think on many of these questions of detail, they are controversial points, and a great deal can be said for or against the point of view I've taken. In writing this book, I, I wasn't trying to, to write a, a, an authoritative book on Asia because the last thing I consider myself is an expert on Asia. I was trying to learn about Asia while I was out there. And I wasn't trying to give a, a detailed reporter's report on Asia. What I was trying primarily to do is, as Louis Gannett said in, in one of his reviews, to write, it's essentially a spiritual autobiography. And that answers, I think, also one of Mr. Getty's objections. If I do seem to repeat myself a good deal in the book and to wander back and forth a bit, because it's a story of my own growth and I'm sorry that I just can't grow straight up, but people usually don't, and I have to write it the way it happened. Uh, I was very curious about one of the attitudes which ran throughout the book, deriving a good deal in attitude, as you yourself said, uh, from Margaret Mead, and uh, as a person, uh, as a non-believer, I was interested that uh, as a device that you used a disbelief and a completely scientific explanation as the best way of understanding uh, other religions in addition to the uh, prevalent uh, religion of the Western world. I wonder how sympathetic a device that is, Mr. Taylor. I, I don't say it's the, it's the best device, Mr. McCaffrey. It, it happened to be the only one possible for me because not, not, being, not believing in any particular religion myself, the only possible approach I could take to Eastern or any other religions was to start, try to, to use what little knowledge of scientific concepts that I have to understand them. You know, Mr. McCaffrey, in his book, Mr. Taylor points out, having been in the psychological warfare section, that all these uh, delusions which people suffer from, and all people suffer from them, are a form, the expression of those delusions is a form of psychological warfare. And it took him a few years in the Far East, in that uh, division of psychological warfare, to understand that and to bring that to people's attention through this book. And it is so true. The other day, I was talking with uh, Narashi Pasha, the Prime Minister of Egypt, who is here trying to plead the case of the Sudan for Egypt before the United Nations. And I asked him, I said, what is Egypt's attitude in the Arab League toward the Zionists in Palestine now? since you're here to plead your case and to denounce Britain in the Sudan. He said, oh, I'm here only for the one thing that has nothing to do with what I have come to this country for. Now, what Mr. Taylor, I gather, has pointed out in his book, in his uh, explanation of the battle between uh, the Hindus and the Muslims in Pakistan, in all these mental delusions, is that you cannot, as Narashi Pasha has done, separate one from the other and only go for what you want. You must take other people's feelings, desires, national ambitions into consideration. We cannot live in a world where we demand only what we want. Mr. Getting? Well, all that is very true. As I say, we concede all of that, and it's all right for Mr. Taylor to feel as no, he Rashi did. Pasha does not Obviously, concede Obviously, when Mr. Taylor writes a book as he does, he's trying to pass on his knowledge and his gains to other people. Now, the idea of the validity of the book, has he done that well or hasn't he done it well? And, and I don't think that he has. I think he's confused and put everybody into a state of delusions that weren't there before. Well, you know, Mr. Getty, I'm inclined to agree with you that perhaps Mr. Taylor hasn't done it as well as I thought he had when I hear your comments on it. Well, that's, <laughs> he, that's very well taken. Now, let's take the, the attitude of Mr. Ta <laughs> of Mr. Taylor on war. Mr. Taylor was in the armed forces, and he talked about the psychological warfare, the, the Office of Strategic Services, where he probably did a very good job. And he says that it was murder for Allied aviators to drop bombs on sleeping women and children. On Hiroshima, he, he uses the device of quoting Indians rather than himself saying things, which I think he believes. In other words, that we are now suffering a neurosis of guilt for having dropped the bomb. All of those things... And you don't know exactly where Mr. Taylor stands on the question of war. If war came tomorrow, would he be back in the OSS? I bet he Mr. would. Mr. Taylor? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say one way or the other what I would do, because you, you never could tell what will happen to one's, one's good resolutions. But what I was trying to do in my book is, is to compare our attitudes toward war with the Eastern attitudes toward war, and without, uh, without adopting the pacifist point of view of Mr. Gandhi, for instance, 
At least uh, it did give me the idea that we reached just a little too quickly for that old gat whenever trouble arises, just as the Dutch did in this Indonesian case. Mr. G- you know, Mr. Getty says that if that war comes, he thinks that Mr. Taylor would do so-and-so. But those of us who have believed in the principles which are expressed in Mr. Taylor's book and who have, have had them reinforced in that book will not wait to consider whether we will do again what we did before, but we will try to make it impossible for that again to happen. Not merely because there's an atom bomb in the world, but because war is just no good anyway, with or without the atom bomb. Tell me, Mr. Shaw, is there anything in this book that would help you to get a device to keep us out of war? Yes. Oh, yes. How? Very much so. How? There is a plea, a definite plea, not merely statements of facts, for people to look at basic causes of unrest and to look for the basic causes of their own delusions. That, to my mind, is the greatest plea that this book makes, and it makes it soundly and excellently. Mr. Getty. Well, it says delusions that we, we fear the Russians because we think they're going to upset our economy and our life, and they fear us for the same reason. It's that same old rat race. We know all of these it things. We can rat race, them. Mr. Getty. But now take the you atomic know, bomb, Mr. Shaw. There's not a definite answer in what you're going to do about the atomic bomb. Exactly. He quotes Gandhi what Gandhi would tell Truman. Exactly. And, but he doesn't say now, this is exactly what to do, how to solve the problem. That's why, I tell is, that's why yes. this is such a wonderful book, because it's, Mr. Taylor makes no effort to propose a solution for a worldwide problem which all the statesmen in the world haven't been able to do yet. He doesn't take himse- upon himself the robe of God, and I take my hat off to him for it. He well, poses the problem and stimulates us into thinking. I think it's... Now, on the... On the, on the uh, well, I, I'm in favor of, uh, in these last few seconds, of allowing Mr. Uh, Taylor to assume any role he, he, want, a role he wants. <laughs> well, I, thank you, Mr. McCaffrey. I'd just like to, to say there that uh, I have written quite a bit of book here. Anyway, already, Mr. Uh, Getty was complaining about his 430-some-odd pages rather bitterly. How much more would he complain if I had taken... Uh, added a few more chapters to say uh, what the solution to the atomic bomb well was. at least mr taylor you would be in the, you are now in the happy position of being able to write another book on that solution but i'm i'm terribly sorry and time is up now for both the author and the critics now i'll be back in a minute to tell you about next week's program but first here is a word from your announcer you'll be interested to know that more than 200 books are usually offered to the book of the month club each month by their publishers and that each one is carefully read before the choice of the book of the month can be made Which one of these books is chosen as the selection is always left entirely to a board of five eminent literary craftsmen. A board of judges consisting of Henry Seidel Canby, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, Clifton Fadiman, John P. Marquand, and Christopher Morley. It's seldom realized, perhaps, that this board of judges has an enviable record over the years of finding writers who have subsequently made history. They picked the first successful books and thereby brought richly deserved fame and fortune to such writers as Pearl Buck, Stephen Vincent Benet, John Gunther, Eric Maria Remarque, John Steinbeck, Jan Struther, Lin Yutang, Clarence Day, William L. Shira, Franz Werfel, and many, many others. Once a selection is chosen, it's fully reviewed by one of the judges in the Book of the Month Club News. Along with the review is also given a quick, interesting story of the author. In addition to this, sometimes as many as 70 important new books, good books, though, for one reason or another, not chosen as the Book of the Month, are reviewed by experienced critics. As a special supplement to the news, there's a listing of nearly 50 new and worthwhile books which are alternate choices, to be chosen by members in addition to or instead of the regular selection. And these books carry with them the same dividend credit as the Book of the Month. If you are not now a member of the club, you may get a free copy of the current issue of the Book of the Month Club News by writing to the Book of the Month Club, care of WNBC, New York 20. And now, John McCaffrey, what lies ahead for the author meets the critic? Next week's book of the afternoon is a new novel by Bruce Marshall, an English novelist who has already endeared himself to American readers with his The World, The Flesh, and Father Smith, and Father Malachi's Miracle. Mr. Marshall's new book is entitled Vespers in Vienna and is a dual selection of the Book of the Month Club for August. You will be reading reviews of Mr. Marshall's book during the next week, so you will be sure to want to hear Mr. Marshall himself next Sunday afternoon when he meets his critics, Father William C. Kernan, Executive Director of the Institute of American Democracy, who will defend Mr. Marshall's book, and Mr. C.G. Paulding, Literary Editor of the Commonweal Magazine, who will take up the opposition. And now, before closing, I'd like to thank Edmund Taylor for coming here to discuss his new book, Richer by Asia. And thank you, John Getty and Bruno Shaw, for joining us. This is John McCaffrey saying... This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Thank you.